Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome to A Lovely John, where we talk about literature. In today's episode, I'm going to start off with Ethan Froh. So first of all, I want to say thank you to A Bear and a Bee Book, Samantha, who has her own booktube channel, which I will link in the description down below. Uh, she requested this work, and I had never read anything by Edith Wharton before, and um, so I jumped into this one, and I really, really enjoyed it. I did, read it in two sittings in less than 24 hours, and it's not a very long read, but it is a phenomenal work, and I am really excited to talk about it today. So if you have any requests for any books that you would like to see analyzed, leave it in the comment section down below. I do get to them. Depending on how long the book is, it may take me a little bit of time to read it, digest it, think about it, analyze it, prepare notes, and then get to filming it. But do put it in there. Um, I have a backlog of all of the requests that I've gotten so far, and I will get to yours as well. So if there are books, let me know. Let me know which ones you want to hear about. So for today's episode, episode one, we will be doing a summary of the book, we'll be talking about the author, and then we're also going to take a look at a frame narrative. Before I dive in too deeply into the plot of the book, let us actually begin with a little bit of information about Edith Wharton. So Edith Wharton is an, was an American uh, novelist. She lived from 1862 to 1937, uh, and she was actually the first female novelist to ever win the Pulitzer Award, um, or Pulitzer Prize. She was highly connected in uh, society, and her novels often revolve around sort of like the decline and fall of the American elite at the end of the 19th century. So in particular, like Age of Innocence is probably her most famous novel set in among the social elite of New York City. Um, this work is a little bit different. This is set in a provincial town. In Massachusetts, um, and while it is about the decline and fall of a particular character, it's not necessarily dealing with social mores or culture as a greater whole. So let's talk about what the story is about. So this story is about its titular character, Ethan Frome. The narration investigates how a man like Ethan, a man with a great deal of potential, he's tall, he's handsome, he's strong, um, is poor, uh, trapped in Starkfield, clearly has been injured in a horrible accident, and um, basically how did he get to that point? Um, and he is trapped, as mentioned, in Starkfield, Massachusetts, and if you're wondering if that has any significance inside the name, yes, it is a Stark place to live, and I think that title, that name of this town is purposeful. I don't know if it's an actual place, I didn't look that up, but I suspect that it's a name that she's manufactured for this work. We discover that Ethan is trapped in a loveless marriage to a hypochondriac. His wife's name is Zena, and Zena's cousin has come to live with them. Uh, her name is Maddie. Her parents have both died, and she doesn't really have any other relatives that she can go to, so she's sort of stuck at the charity of this you know, uh, distant relative. And it's been a useful thing for them because Maddie is, helps uh, around the house. She does chores and cooking and cleaning and that sort of thing. Um, and for her, she gets room and board and, you know, people to actually take care of her um, while Zena is dealing with her various quasi-imagined illnesses. Um, but as the story progresses, it becomes clear quickly that Ethan and Maddie are in love with each other. And Zena is very much aware of this and obviously not happy to see it. And the story culminates with Zena basically demanding that Maddie leave the house and she would basically be abandoned to, you know, nothing. She doesn't have anywhere to go, she doesn't know any other people, she has no skills to speak of, so um, it's basically sending her away to a pretty horrible fate in, at this time. Um, and Ethan really struggles to find a solution. So I'm not going to give away um, an, the ending in this or what happens to these characters. And in fact, I don't think I'll end up talking about it directly in the rest of my episodes, but oh my gosh, so worth a read. Absolutely, strongly suggest this work. Um, and before I go any further in my recommendation of this book, I do want to warn sensitive readers and viewers that this book brings up issues of depression and suicide, hypochondria, and other issues surrounding mental illness. So if you're sensitive to any of those issues, be aware that that, that content is in this book and we'll be touching on it a little bit in my episodes as well. All right, so let's move on to what a frame narrative is and how it's used in this book and a little bit about why. 
So the story actually opens and closes with a first-person narrator who is stuck in Starkfield, Massachusetts for work. Um, the long winter ends up keeping him there much longer than he otherwise would be, um, and in the opening chapter he narrates his curiosity about Ethan. He sees him in town and he's very curious about this man. To the narrator, Ethan stands out, again because it's clear that Ethan has a limp and he has a scar across his face from an old injury. He is grave and very quiet. Um, he contains a sort of powerful determination to move forward in life. Um, and. The townspeople talk about this accident this ha that happened, this smash up, but they're not very specific about what actually happened, so it kind of creates a serif mystery around this character. Eventually, the narrator engages Ethan to help him travel between Starkfield and then the small town sort of outside of that where the factory is that he's actually doing work in. And so Ethan um, sort of picks him up with his horse and, uh, like, not really carriage, what's the word I'm looking for? wagon uh, and they travel back and forth between this place and so they get a little bit of a relationship and a friendship but again Ethan is a very taciturn he's very reticent to speak so he doesn't learn a lot um, and it's clear that despite Ethan's accident and hard times Ethan is an intellectual he knows a lot about engineering and science which this character appears to be an engineer of some kind and so they kind of have that connection and share that interest um, but the chapter closes with them sort of getting caught in a blizzard and seeking safety in Ethan's house. So the horse kind of like just naturally finds its way back home. And um, the character, uh, through spending the evening in Ethan's home, gets clear insight, sort of has all of his questions answered. The next chapters of the book are go back in time and basically tell the story leading up to this smash up, to this accident that has happened. And the reader, at the same time, as the narrator is basically learning and uncovering and discovering this mystery of who Ethan Frome is, um, answering the question of why Ethan is the way he is, how this sort of noble looking intellectual man is trapped in this barren landscape, burdened in poverty. And the final chapter of the book returns to this unnamed first person narrator who through the experience of staying the night in Ethan's home has also had his questions answered. So why a frame narrative? So this is very much in Alexander fashion. I talked about this a little bit about sort of um, different questions to ask of a text. So I'm gonna put it in the context of what I talked about in those episodes of my literary theory uh, series. So um, basically we have identified a key sh uh, structure in the text. So it answers a how question. The question is, how does the author structure or present the story? And the answer is in a frame narrative. Now, I want to ask the question, oh, and I should say, like, if it wasn't clear from my description so far, a frame narrative is where it's sort of like book-ended with some other narrator, the opening chapter and closing chapter, and then it's sort of the central part of this novel in particular is third-person narration about the story. So we pop in and out of that narrator's voice, and then we get the context of the story itself. So hence it's a frame, because it goes around the outside of the main content of the story. So now I want to ask a why question. Having answered a how question, I want to ask a why question about that, which is why would Wharton use a frame narrative to tell this story? Um, why introduce an unnamed first person narrator, construct realism around him, a reason for him to be there, a reason for him to get trapped, um, a reason for him to end up at Ethan Frome's house? Um, and it's a lot of work for an introduction to a story that then jumps, you know, 20 years in the 24 years in the past, I think we're told, um, to tell the story about Maddie and Ethan and when she first came to be a part of their family. So um, another way to think about this question is to say, you know, what would be lost if we got rid of those opening and closing chapters? What would be lost if we got rid of this frame? And once you kind of ask that question, it becomes pretty clear that the work would be very different and it would be a lot less effective of a story. So let's take a look at what the frame actually accomplishes here. So a frame narrative basically gives the answer before we've asked the question. So normally when a novel is told in like sequential order, in chronological order, um, the questions that you're asking are what happens next? You have, are encountering a situation, well, what happens next? And then that gets expanded upon and then you go, well, what happens after that? Um, and so this story without the frame that narrative basically would ask the question, what happens when Maddie comes to stay with the Fromes? 
With the frame narrative, the question gets kind of inverted, and the question is, what happened before the narrator came into town and discovered this broken man, and what caused him to be broken? It's a question that looks to the past, it looks to the origin, um, it looks to the source or the starting place, rather than a question that looks to the result. So, a frame narrative wants to know the cause, a normal story without a frame narrative or without flashbacks or whatever wants to look at the result. Now, neither of these questions or ways of organizing a story is better than the other one. It just depends on what you're trying to accomplish as a writer. Um, and questions about source, origin, or cause, they're introspective questions. And since this book is essentially about Ethan Frome, it is a character um, study of this man. Um, these are the types of questions that it's going to be asking because it's introspective about the character itself. Um, and it's so, in other words, what we're saying is that the form that Morton has chosen suits the purpose of the novel. They reinforce and support each other. Um, questions of what happened next, on the other hand, or results-oriented questions are about events or plots. And these are, you know, extrospective. If one is introspective, I'm going to make up the word extrospective. You're welcome. And so these questions are extrospective questions, and they're questions pointed at society as a whole, at life, at reality, not necessarily about individuals, though they do use individuals as exemplars of larger things that are happening in this greater context. So all of this means that for this novel, we are investigating the deeper, deepest inner self of Ethan, and we are not examining broader sociological questions through an exemplar. So that actually, I'm going to, it's a little bit of a shorter episode, but we're going to actually wrap it up here for episode one, because I have some pretty complex and long topics to get into in the next one. So for episode one, we talked about the frame narrative. We talked about how it's an introspective, um, basically in purpose. And um, in the next one, we're going to talk a little bit about why the novel needs to introspect, why we're investigating this person who is Ethan Frome. So I hope you enjoyed that episode, and I look forward to seeing you guys on the next one. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.